Right now, the trial of George Zimmerman, it has re-raised questions about race relations in America. We will have a frank conversation about race and justice today. And next, Obama's apparently eyeing New York's very own police commissioner for a top post in the administration. Could and should Ray Kelly be the next Secretary of Homeland Security? And later, as the House works to repeal Obamacare yet again, we got surprising new numbers show just how effective health care might reform be right here in our neck of the woods. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to RFL. I am Richard French, and thank you so much for joining us this Wednesday evening, July 17th. The death of Trayvon Martin and the subsequent acquittal of George Zimmerman, it has raised a host of questions about where we are really as a nation when it comes to race relations. Now, if anyone thought this story ended with a verdict late Saturday, obviously they were wrong here. And many ask if the acquittal should be met by resignation or even rage here. And what do these different kind of responses really say about our country's current relationship when it comes to race and the lack of honest dialogue, frankly, that surrounds it. So tonight, we will begin our coverage with what we hope will be a really honest and upfront conversation about where we are on that subject right here in America. Now, before we begin, let's get the very latest on the aftermath of the trial. And for that, let's bring in senior political correspondent Andrew Whitman. Andrew? And Rich, we're continuing to learn more about what happened inside the jury room during deliberations as we hear from four more of the jurors who reached that controversial verdict in the George Zimmerman trial. Coast to coast people are expressing anger and disappointment in response to that fateful decision. Their verdict still sparking protests from coast to coast. And now four of the six jurors who acquitted George Zimmerman of second degree murder and the death of Trayvon Martin are commenting for the first time, releasing a statement calling their experience, quote, highly emotional and physically draining saying, quote, the death of a teenager weighed heavily on our hearts, but in the end, we did what the law required us to do, adding they do not stand by the controversial comments made by juror B-37 to CNN's Anderson Cooper. Do you think Trayvon Martin played a role in, in his own death? I believe he played a huge role in his death. Meanwhile, some of the nation's most influential people are speaking out from Stevie Wonder. Until the stand your ground law is abolished in Florida, I will never perform there again. To Attorney General Eric Holder. Trayvon's death last spring caused me to sit down to have a conversation with my own 15-year-old son. And the head of the National Action Network, the Reverend Al Sharpton, is organizing what's being called a National Justice for Trayvon Day coming on Saturday with rallies planned in 100 cities. Rich. Thanks a lot, Andrew. I want to bring in our panel on this. Dominic Carter, of course, political journalist and author, and Reverend Dr. W. Franklin Richardson. He is a senior pastor of the Grace Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, New York. And Pastor, thank you very much for a few minutes. And, and obviously, I want to get your take on this, but you also have a personal connection to this. Um, as many may remember, you were down in Sanford, Florida. You were there with the Martin family um, before this case even went to trial. Um, and I know you have a close connection to them. What has their reaction been? I think for many, their grace in this whole tragedy here um, has in a lot of ways allowed there to be a conversation here. While there's been uh, certainly sadness, the rage has been tempered by a certain degree. I think in, this no, in no small part to them. Yeah, I think that the family has modeled a, an appropriate response, a response that leaves room for healing and for conversation. And I think they ought to be commended. Uh, they have, it's one thing to have to have the grief, but also to take on the burden for how you uh, influence uh, our community uh, to respond to this uh, tragedy. You know, we spent a lot of time in this program at the beginning of the week, um, Pastor, talking about how the prosecution, um, let's put it politely, did not do a very strong job and how this was mishandled. Um, by the uh, law enforcement uh, from jump here. It took six weeks before a real investigation even took place. And as we know, uh, Mr. Zimmer went home that first night, wasn't even detained, let alone charged. Were they still, given all of that, shocked by the verdict? Did they really think at least there would have been a conviction on manslaughter? Yes, no question about it. We all shocked uh, that, um, that, the, that the system 
delivered a miscarriage of justice. You cannot, you cannot um, reconcile the fact that someone uh, instigates a confrontation and it turns into a fight, a fist fight, it becomes a gun fight when a gun is pulled, made, brought into the situation. And then the person who killed and initiated goes away with nothing and a young boy is dead and nobody is held responsible. Now that is a miscarriage of our system. And you know sometimes the system, you can, the system cannot always be the godfather. The system has to sometimes be challenged. We must not ask was it legal, we must ask was it moral. Did it, did it represent what was right and correct? That's always what we have to measure our judicial system by. That's how the civil rights movement was, was born. It's discrimination, second class citizenship, separate but equal, sitting in the back of the bus, all that was legal. It was the law of the land, but it was not moral. And when people stand up for what's moral, legal, gets adjusted, gets modified, gets changed. And that's what we have to do now. What happened here was a tragedy, people are frustrated, people are hurting, but we have to take this frustration and use it as an opportunity to challenge the system to become a system more moral and not just be a legal system. I want to get to some of the honest dialogue we, we want to have here about race and where we are in this country, but a few uh, more than process facts. We heard what the Attorney General had to say. Andrew played a clip of it. He also went on to say that that same day he was going to have a conversation with his 15-year-old son, a conversation his father had with him mm -hmm. about, frankly, <coughs> to be a young black man um, and how to handle certain situations and what to expect, whether it's fair or not. You could read that one of two ways. One is the Justice Department's going to take this very seriously. Another way is he was talking about stand your ground. They may want to change this from a statute, but the Justice Department may not take this case on because they don't think they can win it on the civil rights side. Mm -hmm. What is your expectation not just what will happen, but what you expect this Justice Department to do with the pressures of having the first black president and attorney general right now in Washington? Well, we never pursue uh, corrective messages with the assurance of what the outcome is going to be. That's what's available to us now. What's available is to push the judicial system to look hard, and if there's any possibility to correct this, to correct it. So you'll be disappointed if they don't at least try and bring a case against them? No Zimmer. question. No question. Because right now, that seems to be the only legal redress to the miscarriage of justice civil in San Francisco. Right. Uh, civil cases. Yeah. But so I, I think that that's what, what my concern is. I think something else is very important in this. And I want to always try to put this in balance. While we have the attention of the African American community, Trayvon Martin situation is tragic. I know that and I, and, I, and I feel for their parents and I've been there. But it's also an opportunity to take the attention that this has brought to us to look at the uh, byproducts of our own violence mm. in, the, in the African American community. Well, Dominic's been saying that. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean that 90% of uh, murders of black people are done by black people. Mm. I mean that there's violence I've been fighting in, in, from, from, from Chicago to Mount Vernon. We kill our own. Now, that's not simply putting the weight on African Americans. It's, it's telling us to wake up and see that that's going on in our communities. We got to stop that at the same time, we got to challenge a system that is being driven by a value system that African American life is in balance. It's, we got to hold both of them in it. And on the other side, you got to also say, why is it that there's so much crime in black communities. What is it about the fallout, the collateral damage of, of racism, of, of, of segregation and slavery that still affects us years after 1865? Because the minority community is still without jobs, disproportionate to the white community, still without, uh, still has, a, whatever measure you use on quality of life, it's the lowest in black communities. Uh, whether it's infant mortality, whether it's obesity, any disease that you name, it's worse in African Americans. And poverty generates a climate of, for violence. So we, we have to, it, this is a complicated and convoluted 
situation. This is not something that there's some quick fits. Tell the boys to pull their pants up. That ain't that's that's not that's not what this is about. This is about a convoluted situation that that that, that America has never really come face to face with. We come we 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 claim victory too quick. We, and we claim victory because we got a black president. We claim victory because Martin Luther King's statue is on the mall. It's, it's far from over. But let's go back to that night when this happened in Stanford. You have Trayvon Martin didn't live in the hood. He had two parents. Um, he was 17. He was coming back from a convenience store with not a gun in his waistband or drugs on him. No. He had Skittles and right. an iced tea. Right. And yet, whether it's the laws, whether it's guns, whether it's the double standard, where do you start to make changes? Because it's funny, the verdict came down Saturday night, but we were talking about on the show Tuesday night. This thing got me more, and I speak for a lot of people, you say, wait a minute, I heard what